Hi, this is Aaron Hill coming to you from my studio at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Meadware School of Music. I wanted to talk to you today about articulation, basics of articulation. I think that all oboists want to make a dark tone. I think that all oboists want to be able to articulate as fast as they can. Those are two things that they lose a lot of sleep over. I think that fundamentally, the tone can be improved and the articulation speed can be improved by combining the two and handling articulation slowly with as much efficiency as possible. First, I'd like to talk philosophy a little bit and then provide some practical examples as well as some counterexamples. So when we think about each note that you play, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I like to equate the beginning and the end to consonants, like in a word, and the middle more to the vowels. When people think of tone, I think they think the most of the middle uh, as far as overtone distribution, how much fundamental, how much of each overtone, that can be a tough thing to tell uh, in one's own playing. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced performing, listening to a recording of the performance, and the recording sounds quite different from how you felt when you were on stage. Even if you haven't done that, if you set up voicemail on your phone, then you listen back to your voice on the outgoing message, and your voice sounds nothing like it did in your own head. So the vowel part of the tone, the middle part of the tone, can be a hard thing to judge, nice as it is to know that we're making a warm tone. So one of the more objective things you could do is to focus on the beginning and the end. And if the beginning is confident and the end is smooth, your tone in the middle is probably going to be pretty good. And it's a much more objective thing to focus on. When you think about the different woodwind instruments, you think about the difference in how an oboe articulates as opposed to a clarinet. Uh, any of your friends who play clarinet uh, will tell you that they practice articulation constantly. And the thing that's difficult on clarinet is having that initial attack be clear. And the great clarinetists can do that really well. The thing that's much easier on clarinet than oboe is having a nice taper. Uh, as oboists, a nice taper is available to us, but it takes everything going right with the face in the air to make it possible. So if an oboist or a clarinetist articulates well, it'll be like you're in a plane that takes off confidently without question and then lands smoothly because we can all do all of it. And I'm gonna try to break these down as slowly as I can in ways that anyone can understand. Uh, anyone who's filled their tire in their car with air has the experience of using that air machine and that it just hums without delivering any air. And then when it approaches the valve stem, once it touches, immediately the air is at top speed. One of the things that can go wrong the most with articulation is for the air to not meet the reed immediately, so people will test gradually how, much, how little air they can use and still make a sound. I think this is generally a mistake. It's good to start with as much air as is necessary. So as a counterexample, that can be a terrifying way to start a note. If I'm going with a immediate fast air of an air machine filling a tire, then the sound is right there. One of the results that you'll get sometimes is that in the low register, if you're feeling sheepish at all, I call it a fa art articulation that usually comes from wanting to be subtle and careful. And I'll demonstrate a couple of fa ta low Gs. where you sort of test the waters with airspeed and then tongue it. That doesn't necessarily sound bad to the audience, but since internally it's a cautious way of playing, I prefer to know I've played a lot of low Gs before. They'll probably happen if I attack them immediately. And I do think it sounds a little bit better, at least subtly. Now, when you're on stage and you're nervous, I like not to have to think that I'm painting with too fine a brush, but I want it to sound like I'm painting with a fine brush. What I mean by that is, if I'm afraid of the way that the oboe sounds, I'm going to play delicately, gingerly, uh, and when people talk about a bad oboe tone, they usually think of that initial attack being very harsh and edgy. There's that joke that an oboe playing forti the difference between an oboe playing fortissimo and an oboe playing pianissimo is that an oboe fortissimo sounds like and an oboe playing pianissimo sounds like meh. 
because eventually it has to get around to attacking the sound. So if I'm afraid to make the sound and it makes it less likely to come out, I'm going to have a lot of experiences with the note not responding. My solution to that is rather than trying to make the sound delicate by using less air or using a lighter tongue, I'll use the same tongue that I would, the same direct tongue and direct air that I would use when I'm playing loud uh, and harsh, partially, uh, as when I'm playing softly, by rather than covering up the entire center of the reed, I try more to just tongue the corner of it. And you'll notice this, I'll exaggerate by shifting my oboe to my right, which will look like your left. You might notice how much smoother the articulation got, and that's with the same air and the same tongue. Uh, that was an exaggerated motion. You're not going to want to play like a flutist. But ever so slightly to the right from center, so you'll hear how harsh it is in the center. So slightly offset. Can make all the difference, and I feel like I can make a broad motion that's likely to work even when I'm nervous. So, so corner articulation to me is a big key to having a warm sound. The other one is taper, and taper requires so many things to work. I tell a lot of my students that I spent a whole year of lessons focusing almost entirely on if I could get to that last note and taper it nicely. The simulation that I like to do is to sing and then hum as, uh, as loudly as I sing, so that rather than diminuendoing by using less air, which could trail off in pitch like this, if you're not too careful, uh, which could then cause biting and all sorts of bad things. I like to sing and then hum, um, where if you're humming loudly, you can hear that edge, you can feel it in your face, mm, and that's a simulation of the way that the sides of the face will cover the reed during the diminuendo while the air is still going. Um, and then you get your taper. So that covers smooth, uh, confident, smooth beginnings, and then smooth landings. I'll give a couple examples. So those are a few half old Ds, easiest note there is. I want to show you the difference between what I call on-wind tonguing and off-wind tonguing. Lots of people have terminology around this, and I think a lot of them are going after the same sort of thing but terminology can vary. The way that I like to think of it is based on what uh, it looks like when a bow is moving across a violin string, and it's either staying on the string or it's bouncing off. So in an on-wind tonguing situation, the air is uninterrupted, like you turn on a garden hose, and rather than change the notes by either altering the faucet or squeezing the hose at all, you're just putting your finger through the water stream, like so. I'll play a few half whole Ds on wind. So you can make your notes as connected as you possibly can. They can almost sound not completely distinct at times. When playing off wind, I like to simulate bouncing by tapering each note. So rather than a da, 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 I hear more of a dumb, 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 so I'll play a few half whole Ds with that bounce. And speeding it up, you get more of that bounce. Now to provide a couple of practical examples. In real life, especially in music that's slower, you'll use a mixture of on wind and off wind tonguing. Uh, if you just take the first three notes of the solo in the second movement of Beethoven's Third Symphony, those low Gs, the first one's going to bounce off wind, then the next two will connect, like so. So you could hear dumb, da da. If I played them all bounced, it would sound awkward and edgy like this. Which, uh, you could probably tell you'd lose the audition immediately. If you play them all on wind, it lacks that dotted feel. So I prefer to play that first one off, and then you've got it. Off 
wind tonguing, however, going back to the difference between the oboe and the clarinet, the oboe so easily sounds down, bouncy uh, and has a nice time clearly articulating things. It's impossible to bounce an off wind tongue once you get to a certain speed. Uh, first, I'll start with a counter example. Uh, the last movement of Mendelssohn's Third Symphony, which I'm very excited I have coming up this summer. If you tried to bounce tongue it, it would be impossible and it would sound pretty ridiculous. <laughs> so you could tell, very difficult to do. But tonguing on wind at that speed can sound plenty bouncy, so that's all you need. And that's the difference for me between on wind tonguing, off wind tonguing. So to review, there's also the corner versus the center. There's tapering with hums. There's starting the air off immediately. Uh, and there's recognizing the differences between what's easy on oboe, what's easy on clarinet, filling in the gaps as we can. And there's knowing not to be too preoccupied with your tone in the middle uh, and to focus more time into if your tone sounds smooth at the beginning and the end of every note uh, in ways that serve the what the composer wrote as well as possible. Thanks for watching. Joining me today, there will be another video next month on how to play second oboe in an orchestra as well as you can, and I'm very much looking forward to that one. Thanks for your time.